GMK is embedding much, much of this through, uh, through that mechanism as well. Um, uh, I don't remember also, I think one of the last times I met Caroline was in New York at the Ban Treaty, and it was pouring with rain. I got absolutely drenched <laughs> because the march that was taking place was basically uh, in, under a sheet of water <laughs> in monsoon. Um, and funny enough, the last time more or less I met the next speaker, it was also pouring with rain. <laughs> and another demonstration in, um, outside uh, the huge military base uh, in Germany, um, which maybe Ryan will mention. And, uh, so anyway, this is Rainer Brown. He's uh, another amazing uh, international activist, European activist, co-president of the International Peace Bureau. He's been involved in so many things, I can't even remember them all. Uh, and, but this is his major point at the moment. And he will be um, addressing us today. He's addressed us sometimes in the past as well. Some of you will remember he was at our big march that we had uh, in London um, a year or so ago, over a year ago now. Um, so, Ryan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I'm really happy to be here again. And let me start, I think it's a time to say congratulations to all of us. I think this Nobel Peace Prize is such a big success for I think, but I think for all of us, because it's the result of our common work during the last years, many, many years. And you know, I remember very thankful your big rally, February 2016. I think this was also a push for putting the nuclear weapons question again and again on the international and national agenda. So I hope you will do the same that like we will do it in Germany. We will make a day of celebration on the December the 10th, when the Nobel Peace Prize will be given to ICANN in many, many cities in Germany, celebrating together this event. And hopefully, it will give us a little bit new power for our fight against war and nuclear weapons. You know, living in a dangerous time, yes, but why? I think, why is it time? I think we have to look at these questions and to try to find answers to these questions. And I will start giving my thinking about these questions. I think we are living in the middle of a big fight for a new world order. It's a fight between the old traditional power countries, like the United States, which was, in the beginning of the 90s, the only superpower of the world, the European Union, which is a growing superpower but lost influence in the whole world, and the new powers, which become stronger and more influential. Above all, China and India, but I think we also should mention Brazil and other countries from Latin America. This fight between the traditional old ones, which want to keep their power, and the new ones, which want to be stronger, has a lot of success economically, politically, success to be stronger. This is the background of the fight we are living in. And the consequences of these fights, and we, where you can see it, it's on one side, the enlargement of NATO. Enlargement of NATO means they want to keep Russia and today China down and influence them and become bigger and stronger. And they have not the economic power to do it alone by economic affairs, by trade affairs. They need the military power for trying to be stronger than these countries. This is the background of the uncircling of Russia and China with military purposes. This is the background of this discussion that we should pay, we should pay these 2% for, for military expenditure, which means for NATO, instead of 500 billion, 800 billion. And including the US, it means 1.2 trillion. This is, and you know, 
I think you know from your country what does this mean to pay such a big amount for military purposes. This means less money for health care, less money for social purposes, for education, for science, and and that. And, but the background of this militarization is the fight for a new world. And you can see this by a very strong development of the militarization of the European Union. This is a quite new factor. It was really growing after the Brexit decision. What does this mean? We are in front of a European nuclear, European army. It will have another name. The, now, the name now, the European Union bureaucrats are naming it. It is so called, they are developing an European anchor army. This means the strong military powers in Europe, above all Germany and the hegemon in Europe, will take smaller armies under their control and put them into their army. We are doing this with the Polish army, with part of the Polish army, with part of the Czech army, Slovakian army, and the armies of the Baltic army. And we call this anger army. But this is a step in the direction of the European army. The second is we are now developing a European military industrial complex. Not only Airbus. We have the same now by the Marines, mainly between France and Italy. We have the same by tanks between Germany and France. So for the first time we are developing this European industrial complex. We have a European military headquarter. For what we need a European military headquarter? We have NATO. But we have one now in Brussels. And we have even the discussion about European nuclear weapons. And the actual discussion is we are using the French nuclear weapons as basic, but we enlarge them with the influence of other countries. And we have a European nuclear planning group. And who is the chair of this nuclear planning group in Europe? It's a German general. But Germany has signed the NPT contract. This is definitely illegal against international law. Because NPT means nothing to do with nuclear weapons, to say it very simply. But this is the developing of the militarization of Europe, and this is a part of the whole story, the old traditional countries in the world trying to keep their influence, and they believe that they need above all much more military purposes for this. And never forget that Europe is engaged in 14 wars. We are always speaking about the interventional wars of the United States and Great Britain, but Europe is engaged in 40 wars. That is the reality when we are speaking about the militarization of the world and the fight between the old tradition and the new ones about the new military order. And definitely nuclear weapons have a very important role. You know, I am always asking myself, well, why these stupid nuclear weapons countries want to keep these nuclear weapons? For me, the main reason is it is not a weapon. It's a part of the power structure. And you are part of the power system in the world when you have nuclear weapons. This makes it so brutal and so hard to get rid of them. Because we are fighting really against the power structure of these world. And this means any step forward against nuclear weapons is a step forward for a more democratic, for a more liberal, for a more freedom, international development of all of the international system. So that makes is that is the background for me that we are in such a dangerous situation. And I think we are right when many people, including scientists and politicians, are saying no, you know, maybe we are in front of a third world war or a minimum of a big war, which means a nuclear war. I think this is not this is not something which is out of the world. We have to see that the use of nuclear weapons is in the hand of such guys like the President of the United States, and I think Joseph described him, I have nothing to add to these points. So that is the one side. The other side is the question, what is with the peace forces, what is with the opposition against them? And first I would like to say, you know, we have really successes. And the Ban Treaty is one of the big successes. It shows that many countries and governments in the world 
don't want to live with these nuclear weapons any longer and don't want to follow the nuclear weapons countries. They want to be independent and then they want to be a part of the world of a more democratic world order. And this is a very hopeful science. Because you know, these countries or these governments which are in favor of the ban treaty, many of them are not democracies. But they don't want to live any longer under the control of the nuclear weapons countries. And this powerful new, is a powerful new development. And you know, the second is, I was really surprised that I can got the peace, the Nobel Peace Prize. I expected many things. But not a little bit the committee, I was really surprised. It is a sign that they see where is the future. So these are hopeful signs, and you know, you can also say the movement against climate change, or for, against climate change, and the movement for renewable energy is for me a very successful international movement. But you know, we should be realistic and should be very clear with ourselves. We, I think we as peace movement, as worldwide or international peace movement, are to weak for the big challenges. And this is, I think, the main point we have to discuss. How we can become stronger. How we can mobilize more people. How we can organize more young people getting into actions and coming with us on the street. And I hope that I will learn something here. You know, my point of view are three. We need on one, we need much more courage, much more optimism between us. Let's go and try it. And not discuss everything ten times and wait till the time is over. <laughs> you know, and when we're starting, Dave mentioned this, our Rammstein campaign against the US military base, many people were saying this was never working in the past. But we, we were doing it and we were quite successful. And I think we should have much more courage. The second is I think we need much more solidarity between us. Many of our stupid fights between us, we really have to overcome. To stay together in solidarity and in common actions. And I think we also need much more international cooperation and common international actions. You know, we have to come back and to think what's happened on the 15th of February 2003, when we were marching with 15 or 18 million people all around the world against the Iraq war. I think we need again these international actions. And let's think about it for the next year. Let's think if we don't need common actions against military spending. Because when we don't overcome the military spending, this huge amount, this 1.7 trillion, this is not only a question of finances, and that we need the money for social purposes. It is also a question of confrontation of cooperation. Military spending means confrontation to Russia or to China. But we need cooperation, otherwise we will not solve any of the global problems. Who should pay for the Green Climate Fund of the United Nations when we will spend $1.7 trillion for military purposes? There is no money. So the, we need much more action for that. And we need, I think, common international activities against the atmosphere of confrontation, the enemy picture building in the world. So my point of view to you and to your discussion is we are facing a very different situation. And for me, and not only for me, you know, I'm, I'm trained in history. I think many signs are like these famous year 1914. But history never happened twice. So we can prevent it, we can go in another direction. For that, we need more actions, more activities, but let us not forget that we also should celebrate our victory, and one of our victory is that I can in your work of the Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raina. Um, I should have mentioned as well, of course, the International Peace Bureau won itself won the Nobel Peace Prize, but uh, rather a long time before Raina became co president over 100 years ago. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much. I think we've had a lot of uh, ideas and uh, some hope and some encouragement to take courage, to work together, to cooperate, to collaborate 
except on the military right, uh, way, of course, um, together to, to attain a peaceful world. Um, nobody's been working.